Hey friends, Boomy here. With spring in full bloom and summer just around the corner, I wanted to make a video about some of the science of heat acclimation. This is all thanks to a good friend, Marguerite de Leon, who did a deep dive through published studies to source this information. As always, I hope you find that this is useful. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel down below to show support for the work that's been done to bring you this information. Yes, so uh, my, I guess, modern name is Meredith Horn, and in the SEA, I am uh, Marguerite de Leon, a, a white scarf here in Atlantia. Professionally, I studied biomedical engineering. I think that's probably the most relevant thing here. And uh, uh, we're here to talk about what happens when you heat acclimate and what you can do to help yourself heat acclimate in the lead up to Pensac. To start off, the, the reason to care about this, right, is that um, the heat puts a lot of stress on our bodies and more so than normal exercise. So just existing at some place like Penzik or a summertime event is going to increase your risk for a cardiovascular event. It's going to increase your risk, uh, cardiovascular events being stroke, heart attack, those kinds of things, as well as just general stress strain on the body. Uh, you know, we always talk about the effects of heat exhaustion, heat stroke, those things, but there can also be more serious side effects as well. Uh, the, and then of course there is the idea of like, you know, we spend all this time training and we go to Penzik and we have a champions fight, right? We want to do well martially and enjoy as many activities as we can. Uh, and then if you're not a fighter, uh, heat acclimating, can make it so you enjoy more of your Penzik because it's going to be hot, right? Like we can't control if it's a 90 degree Penzik or if it's raining, but I bet at least a couple of those days, it's going to be warm, if not all of it. Right. right? Yep, yep. So kind of yeah. being able to do more despite the heat um, yes. or ways to, yes. to be able to do more despite the heat. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if you think about like our normal days uh, as humans in this modern era, uh, right, we're sitting, both of us right now are sitting in air-conditioned, climate-controlled rooms, mm -hmm. uh, right? We're not necessarily out in the environment as we evolutionarily would have been. We would have experienced the seasonal change in a far more gradual manner than what we do modern in modern times. Uh, and as a result, when we go and then shift to go outside, whether it's the weekend or for an extended period, your body's like, oh, what is this? Like I was acclimated for 70 degrees with AC and no humidity. And now I'm outside in this 90 degree weather. Uh, so there has been a, a, there's a good body of research out there for how to heat acclimate. There's kind of like two, two to three sources of funding or interest, if you will, uh, right? Because when you talk about why do we research things, there's usually either there's like a corporate aspect to it or there's uh, it's coming from NIH, the funding source, that kind of thing. Uh, and in this situation, you have athletic companies who want to do well at the Olympics, have poured a lot of money into doing heat and altitude and all of those different factors of um, human performance evaluation, they've done a lot of research on that. Uh, of course, uh, most Skadians are not professional athletes. So some, like some, even if you are athletic, even if you are, you know, the top of your shape, you are probably not working out as your primary job unless your name is Boomy. So, <laughs> um, Definitely not. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like yeah. most people are not training to run a marathon as their primary source of income. Right. Uh, the second source of these kinds of this body of research is uh, from the military. Uh, because what happens is an event will occur, you know, whether it is uh, like whether it is a conflict or a humanitarian event or humanitarian disaster, excuse me, and our country is going to provide aid. And at the drop of a hat, you can have troops deployed from here in the United States anywhere to anywhere in the world. So they have a lot of research on what do you do if it's sub two weeks, if it's sub a week, if it's 72 hours before you're uh -huh. getting on a plane well, and that, going somewhere. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So 
And that research focuses more on people of, I would say, a broader range of physicality going in, um, still above average, of course, for compared to like un, the everyday population in the United States. But, you know, that's what we got. So, um, any questions so far? No, that's great. That makes a, a lot of yeah. sense as to where the data comes from. It also makes sense as to um, the reasonings we would want to try to find, uh, I suppose, relevant information that we can glean from from that data. Mm -hmm. um, do yeah. you want to show us some of that data? So it's kind of the next. Uh, well, so they don't. We got get this big old paper. Uh, this yeah, guy, cool. this guy talks about. They have this whole. Let's see if we can get this bigger. Um, one of what to do in your heat acclimation protocol. Is this there the military side or is this the, uh, this the is, sport side? This is the military paper, yes. So we'll go in. A lot of this is talking about methods. Like, do you have access to a heated room? Like, can we just crank up the heat? If not, can we go for additional training sessions? What do you have time for? Because, uh, uh, again, the military side of it, the, they expect people to have a full-time job and then be doing heat acclimating outside of their job mm -hmm. versus it being an intrinsic part of training. Oh, uh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so additional, you can, like can you add additional training sessions, right? That's mm -hmm. a, that's a thing. Uh, can groups accumulate, uh, acclimate together? Uh, that's a whole interesting, uh, series of things, uh, that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, can we supervise? So if you said yes to all of that, what they actually do is put you all in a room and they turn up the heat. Uh, so they call controlled uh, hyperthermia. So if we've heard of hypothermia, that's a reduction in your uh, your core temperature. This is an intentional increase of your core temperature. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially that increase of your core temperature is fundamental to what they measure and what we believe the biological basis for heat acclimation is. Uh, so when we're looking at all of these things, you're going to see ways to increase your core temperature and give your body time to deal with the effects of that uh, and how to essentially get heat away from the center of your body and get it get it out of your body. It's okay. kind of what so your body is trying so to do. The acclimation portion is going to be um, self-induced hyperthermia um, with intent. Yes, so of some the kind. Yes. So, uh, so is like how much, what are the controls? What are the parameters? How much exposure, how long? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, for oh, yeah, there's lots of stuff there. We're going to go back here. Right. So yeah, I did get some, I did get some numbers. So whatever your strategy is, there's a huge, there's a number of them. You could like, I have things in here, like take hot baths is actually one that was studied, uh, immediate hot water or sauna 30 minutes after exercise to keep your body temperature up. So 70 to 80% of your adaptions to heat occur within the first four to seven days of exposure. It's actually pretty short. Okay. Uh, after that, your next, you know, 25 to 20% of acclimation is her occurring with up to about two weeks, three weeks is what most papers looked at. So it tapers off. So, okay. yeah, yeah. And there is, so that was with every single day. There is also... A, what happens if you can't do it every day? And there was a study that said that measured, okay, every day we're going to do heat exercise and then we're going to do once every three days and then once every seven days. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially it just extended the timeline. So th with three days being acceptable and seven days made it so there was a maintenance. Okay. So it was 10 days acclimation walking 10 days at a certain pace gradient, you know, an hour in combat clothing, because this was a military paper. Uh, basically, you saw the same. So for 10 days of walking every day, or you could do 14 days, but you took breaks. Oh, I kind see, of how it worked. Okay. Yeah, when you say so and then I think day, there was an is that a uh, is there a certain amount of time to walk? Is there uh, not so, like you do it for 10 days in a row, but um, is yeah. there any, like, how long do you walk or like how high do you need to get your core temp relative yeah. to uh, your base core temp? Yes. That, those sorts of questions. So this study mm -hmm. said walking for one hour uh, in 40 degrees C, which is about 100 
degrees uh, Fahrenheit in 30 degrees relative humidity. It looks, I don't know that they, they did measure individual, what they do is they measure individual core temperatures and look for a percentage increase. Uh, they're not, they didn't really specify what that average is, or at right, least I didn't right. pull it out. Bigger picture, we're talking about walking in this case. However, any exercise done in the heat will help you heat acclimate. The quote gold standard for athletes is to do the exercise that you are going to be performing, you know, in your whatever situation, right, your, your Olympics, your World Series, whatever. Right. Uh, do that exercise in as close to the environment that you can. Or so if you are going from Boston to Denver, that's the classic example because you not only uh, have a potential for a heat difference, but an altitude difference and you have a humidity difference. All of those affect how your body dissipates the extra heat that you're gaining while exercising. Uh, one of the things that your body does uh, is it increases your blood flow away from your skeletal structure and your muscles to your your skin temperature. Uh, so as you heat acclimate, you actually get, you increase your total blood supply to keep more blood in you to have both uh, your muscles and your skin have enough sufficient blood. Uh, not blood, excuse me, plasma, it should be more specific, it increases your plasma. So that way you maintain your blood pressure and you can still get the delivery of nutrients to your muscles while you're exercising and also direct flow to your skin. That way the, the heat can dissipate. Uh, so what they look for in heat acclimation, and you could probably try this at home, is to measure your skin, is to like take your temperature and see what happens over time. Uh, but they also say like you might get increases in weight, that kind of thing. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. Um, and I think that one was that I read that I was like, oh, that's interesting because I think a lot of people go to Pensick and they come home and they expect to lose weight and they don't. And I wonder how much of that is because they heat acclimated while they were there. Mm -hmm. They started retaining a bit more water. Active heat acclimation. So this is, you're doing exercise. The, the kind of rule of thumb was every day is the fastest, once every three days to make progress, and then once every seven days to have a baseline, like maintain. Okay. Um, things. However, can't do that. There is also what they call passive heat acclimation. Okay. Uh, this is where uh, saunas after exercise or in a hot, what they call hot water immersion, which is, you know, just a bath. Uh, <laughs> for the similar, it's about, they put it for what, 30 minutes or a sauna was what was tested, uh, 40 to 45 minutes in a hot water bath. Yeah. And that also produced similar effects. Uh, not going to be one-to-one, -one, mm -hmm. but it is still shown to have the, uh, core temperature reduction. Basically, basically if you measure that core temp of someone who has heat acclimated is it is a slightly lower than someone who hasn't mm -hmm. uh, and it basically just gives your body more room to get warm before it needs to really start pushing that heat out uh to maintain you know cellular structures and everything that's gonna start breaking down once you get too hot um okay so what do you do if you don't have what? said it was four to seven days so less than a week let's say um, the big one is that daily heat exposure. As I said, it was like four to seven days of daily heat exposure will help. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like the week before Pensick, if you wanted to do it, think of it that way, or the week before, let's say Ruby Joust here in Atlanta is a big one that might, the heat might be quite high for, um, or even less than that, say less than four days. Uh, so another one that I thought was really interesting and uh, the water bearers will not like this, uh, permissive dehydration. Mm -hmm. So you intentionally let yourself remain, like you do exercise, run around, whatever. Mm -hmm. You don't consume water for 30 minutes afterwards. Right, intentional dehydration. So like intentionally give yourself like 30 minutes. Uh, the This found that... 
it was five days of normal heat acclimation. In this study, they did 90 minutes of cycling every day mm -hmm. uh, where they measured the core temperature of the person uh, versus the, they had two groups, one that immediately drank as much water as they wanted whenever, and one that abstained from fluid intake for the duration of the exercise and about 30 minutes afterwards. Okay. The uh, group that didn't, that abstained, that didn't drink, had 8% more, higher increase in plasma volume. Uh, or excuse me, it was 8% total increase in plasma volume versus 4% of the ones that were drinking whenever they wanted. So again, that plasma volume being important because your body is trying to pump blood to both your skeletal structure and your muscle structure and to your skin, uh, nutrients for your muscles, and then heat dissipation for the skin. Okay. So th the plasma going up is important. Yep. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. The second one was protein intake, mm -hmm. was increasing the basically increasing the amount of protein increases your plasma excuse me increasing the amount of protein you consume increases the amount of plasma you contain basically which i think is pretty pretty well known like you you need water with your most people recommend if you're taking protein to also drink more water so after that it gets into what do you do at an event or okay. at in in the situation where there's a lot of heat um, which was also interesting. Um, so, oh, so one of the things I also did read about was about, was the, I didn't include too much data on it just because, uh, it was hard to get access to papers that didn't have a paywall for everyone, but right. the, your clothing that you wear changes how you sweat. Okay. So... If you are wearing like a tank top and shorts when you go and do your heat acclimation, your body is going to learn to sweat where, a certain way. But if you do it in your clothing, in the clothing, like more representative of what you would fight in, right? So I fight it with covered arms um, and, you know, covered torso. So if I fight in something some more, or excuse me, if I heat acclimate in something more similar to that, I'm going to learn how to sweat differently, if that makes sense. Like different area, the exposed skin is going to preferentially sweat more than the unexposed skin. Um, and it was kind of interesting because essentially your body, like when you sweat there or when any liquid evaporates, there's something called the, the water vapor layer at the very edge of that surface. And your body responds to that pressure. Like it, it notices when the sweat isn't evaporating and then we'll preferentially sweat somewhere where it is evaporating more. It's like, okay, that is very detailed, but yes. <laughs> okay. So, so to, to um, break that down, um, when your body senses that evaporation on the surface of the skin is happening, it will divert more effort to sweating in those yes. locations. And so your clothing, yes. how well it breathes and thus, uh, evaporates mm -hmm. will will change that. Okay, right. So if yeah. you're wearing a yeah, which bag, I think you'll sweat out of your head and your hands. <laughs> yes, your right. body's That's gonna. I mean, not it's not gonna be 100, yeah, percent but you're gonna get like more sweat volume in one area versus yep. the other. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and of course, you know, uh, skatians know this. Like, if you wear more, like, like linen, or you wear chainmail, it's a lot less hot than wearing some polyesters or certain things. Right, right. So generally, it is um, maximized surface area um, that can mm -hmm. breathe, given the context of what you're doing, uh, the fighting or, or right. whatever it is that you're doing. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, the other one at Pensick that is interesting is that sunscreens and deodorants can impair your evaporation, your, your sweat. Um, cool. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, circling cool. back to the deodorant portion, did that come from the military <laughs> or the, uh, that was else? a separate, I, kind of uh, I think that. actually they quote, it was a sort uh, it was cited in the military studies, but it was a, Oh, interesting. Yeah, there was one thirty. So that's the one they referenced. That's the actual public publication. Yeah. 
Okay. It's the PubMed. Uh, this, uh, so this one I don't think has, yeah, we can't see too much of what they did. Oh, uh, yeah, here we go. This is what, where this was. Yeah, you can see it was the antiperspirant. Sunscreen B was the mineral sunscreen. I wish they had just called it mineral sunscreen. Um, but the control is no blockers, nothing. Uh, and then sunscreen A, and again, antiperspirant, which is slightly different than a deodorant. It's the important one. And then, yeah, the, I think there was also two, wasn't there? It's another study. It's 139. It was the aluminum is this one. Mm, okay, yep. Yeah, which is, the, it's the heavy metals that block it. Makes sense, but... Uh, yeah, so the human forearm biopsy tissues containing endocrine sweat glands were inhibited from firing by occlusive uh, application of aluminum chloride, uh, chlorohydrate, uh, which is found in your, your antiperspirants. Okay. Uh, so it, essentially that molecule, molecule is doing something in that gland to present it from, and they may have even gone into what it does. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, um, so is the, so, uh, applicable recommendation is that don't, uh, if you're going to use anti, uh, or if you're going to use deodorant, use the kind that does not include heavy metals, anything that's antiperspirant. Zinc, zinc or the aluminum. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's the, I think most of your deodorants these days don't include them. Uh, of course, there are going to be some that do. I would need to go look at the brands. Yes, yes. Um, and then the other one um, that they recommended in many of these papers, mm -hmm. uh, of course, doing activities in the shade, right? We all know that. But when you're now in the situation where you're in a heat hotter environment than you're used to, it's the cold shower. So now we're doing the inverse of what we wanted to do before, where we're trying to drop that core temperature. And even though it, it may not feel it immediately, but if you go, you take that cold shower and you can get that core temperature down, it's gonna give you more time before your core temp gets too high again. Right. So that was another big recommendation. Yeah. That is, uh, for all those out there uh, listening to this, this is one of the most important bits of advice in terms of when you're actually at the <laughs> event. This is, not, this is not the acclimation point coming before the event. At the actual event, wherever you are, uh, when you are starting to feel overheated or any symptoms thereof, the most important thing is to lower that core temperature. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to um, like take all of the, the gear off. If you're like, hey, I'm in the middle of a tournament, I can't. It's not very functional. What you can do is just take ice and put it onto your core or any cold liquid, just mm -hmm. things like that. Or take off something that makes, if, if, if there's an outer layer that prevents breathing uh, as far as airflow and evaporate, uh, all that matters. All of that matters. And I know per personally, I try and keep cold beverages. So for Pensix, this doesn't work. But what I do is I freeze water bottles the night before. Uh, so that way, if it's a hot event the next day, um, the water that I'm drinking is cold. Right, right, exactly. Uh, and then you get helps with that. Yeah. Yep. That is a, a very key thing to both preventing injury, uh, like medical um, uh, happenstance, as well as uh, generally it betters your performance and longevity uh, on the field. Okay. I know I don't like taking really warm showers at Pensick. That's always been a personal preference as well. But, you know, right. maybe I did something that helps keep my temp low. Uh, the CDC has a bunch of guidelines. Actually, Gatorade had a really good set of kind of digestible guidelines on this but again it just really came down to go into the here we can actually go into this environment mm -hmm. be in the environment uh, do be in the environment and, and just do that at some regular interval uh the most of these studies talk about more of the physiological specific things that happen when we do acclimate, right? So I already mentioned plasma volume. Mm -hmm. Here it's giving a bigger uh, explanation, if you will, of uh, you know exactly what's going on here. Essentially, 
uh, you know, that blood volume being redirected again to the skin. Internally, that means there's a reduction of available blood volume to go to the skeletal structure, and that's including muscles and the skeleton itself. Uh, so the, and also that means that's less fluid, less blood and associated nutrients available for everything else that your body needs to keep doing while you're exercising. Mm, okay. uh, so I actually, uh, there was a cognitive, yeah, they, they talk about it a little bit in this one. Um, one of the things that they noted in this study is a cognitive decline when you haven't heat acclimated uh, and a higher incidences of job related mistakes, that kind of thing. The theory is in part, your body's under all this stress from heat mm -hmm. and a lower volume of plasma. And then as a result, your brain isn't necessarily, one, it's worried about all this other stuff. And then two, it doesn't have this plasma. It isn't necessarily getting the volume it needs up into there as much as it should be. Uh, because your body is pretty good about making sure you stay alive first. Right, right, absolutely. <laughs> um, so a lot of these, uh, so like a severe reduction of your internal blood volume, right? Um, it says it here. However, with continuous exercise, low central blood volume, reduced renal blood flow, that's your kidneys, mm -hmm. bad, uh, and plasma hyperosmolality simulate the uh, alderstone and antidiuretic hormone secretion, which upregulates fluid retention mechanisms. Um, so that's how you get thirsty, essentially. But repeatedly doing this is what builds additional plasma into your your system. Yeah, yeah, and that's a lot. A lot of how bodies work, right? When we, you know, this when you exercise, it's that repeated yeah, stimulus. stimulus. Yeah. You're doing that on a molecular level, right, right. essentially, Just with this. That. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So there's that one. Oh yeah, heart rate. Great. So we all know this, right? It's hot. That heart rate goes way up. Um, and again, it's trying to push all that blood around one to dissipate heat. And then also to make sure that your muscle and has what it needs. Uh, so one of the factors of, so one, this is where that increased risk of cardiovascular event occurs because there's more strain on your heart. Right. And, uh, while, and when you do heat acclimate, what they see is your heart rate doesn't go as high okay. with the same amount of endurance. Right. So effectively you get more endurance, but it's because your heart has now acclimated to it. Right. Okay. Yeah. So basically what, what does this one say? It's increased preload of the stroke volume. So your heart has four chambers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it can change its blood th flow through those chambers, like two are for your, uh, or for your lungs and two or for the rest of your bloody and the body. And there's like, it goes into the one and then it, the first chamber essentially changes how much, um, the two chambers can essentially increase how much they're expanding to contract. That's what they're saying by stroke volume is mm -hmm. they're getting more volume in there. And the first one is the, I believe the preload, but it's been a minute since I had to take that class. <laughs> so don't take my, my word for it. Uh, but basically you get more volume through those two chambers mm -hmm. and that reduces the heart rate total because it's still volumetrically doing the same amount of work. Uh, we're not, well, it is more work in a muscular sense, but it is less hard on your heart because it isn't beating as fast right. yep, yep. Makes sense. Uh, to maintain the output. Um, oh, I also wanted to cover mm -hmm. what should you feel if you've heat acclimated? Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about what you should right? feel if I think, you heat acclimated. Um, yes. So you should see, in the short term, you should see some of this, but it's more of like a longer term result. Okay. Uh, endurance is one I already mentioned. Yep. Um, right. This one talked about it. The, I did have a study about it. Uh, heat acclimation protocols improve performance by 20% in the long term, while short term, less than seven days protocols resulted in an improvement of 7% uh, time based on time test trials. So essentially they had them do exercise to exhaustion yep. and measured how far the difference between those. Uh, so again, starting early and 
doing that longer term is going to get you more bang for your buck mm -hmm. versus doing it like four days of it. That was the biggest one of like things you could measure, which is like if you're a person who runs or something like that. Uh, and then the other one that you can measure is body temperature, taking your temperature every day and seeing it, it should drop a little bit. A lot of these studies looked at people in what we consider the prime of their life, 18 to like 35. Uh, and there was a couple notes uh, because generally they basically as you age, your the effect of the responsiveness to heat acclimation doesn't necessarily change. Like you will heat acclimate with exposure, that kind of thing. However, your thermal tolerance lowers. So they basically said it isn't well studied, but people who are older may need more time to fully heat acclimate than these two weeks we're talking about. Okay. Yep. Um, it was also noted that certain medications can affect, affect heat acclimation, but I couldn't find anything that said like it didn't occur. It just took longer than for someone not on those medications. Did they give a any sort, or have you found any sort of a timeline for either the it, medications or the age? Any cor correlation? No, it, so it was, or they're not. It was just. Done. It was just like. It was like just a noted. Um, I I suspect it's a not enough of the tested population fit into those two categories. Right. To. To, to, for them to have enough data. Right, uh, so, yeah. Okay. Um, and then the other one that increases heat tolerance is general fitness activity. Mm -hmm. um, so the higher fitness you are starting, your body actually, from doing exercise, has already come up with these ways to deal with the heat you generate, and it's better over time. However, they did note being better, being in better shape it does not replace having a heat acclimation regime. Um, right. so the two kind of work in tandem. Right. So you're generally uh, and then, more going to adapt faster and, and be more comfortable if you're in better shape. Um, yes. but not, which makes sense, but it does not, uh, replace the results of like the couple of weeks of prep work mm -hmm. that can yield much better results yeah. for, for actually just being there and acclimate. Acclimation. Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, and then the last note, which is actually, which is kind of nice mm -hmm. is that, uh, <laughs> There, uh, they have, okay. Uh, so in terms of people these days are pretty familiar with genetics and DNA, um, right. DNA is the source of the, the, the base codes that produce our proteins. Um, there has been a lot of research the last 20 years into maybe longer, but, um, what we call epigenetic factors, which are a class of proteins that sit on our DNA and regulate when those genes are expressed. Uh, I distinctly remember my college professor describing them as a giant gorilla that would bat away proteins that try and bind and replicate the DNA so you could produce protein, uh, which is just a visual that stays with you forever. But uh, they, can, they can prevent or uh, encourage expression of genes. And with heat acclimation, uh, they have found that every year you heat acclimate, you get more of these epigenetic factors that are related to heat acclimation. So you get more of these proteins that promote the responsiveness of these, of this phenotype. And as a result, every year you do it, it gets a little easier. Oh, uh, okay. So regular so, heat exposure, like if yeah. you are... Which, yeah, and if you think about it evolutionarily, that makes complete sense because, you know, we experienced seasons every year mm -hmm. for mil millions of years before we invented heat, you know, like air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> okay. At least every three days, you want to be having some kind of heat exposure. That would be, that was the most consistent rule. So whether that is exercise, passive, or whatever, something to get that core temperature up. So three days, every three days, get your core temperature up. To maintain after that, it's once a week. Uh, and then, of course, remember your, during your heat exposure, remember your fluids and take steps to reduce your core temperature rising unnecessarily from the environment around you. Those would be the two big ones. 
And I would also say that every three day rule should be in line with your personal fitness situation, right? Um, if you are someone who is not necessarily regularly exercising, just go for a walk in the heat. That's fine. If you are someone who does regularly exercise in some fashion, it's just about taking that thing you're already doing and bringing it outside into the natural air. Uh, cool. Awesome. I appreciate uh, you sharing the information that you have. And thank you so much for, for spending Thanks. your time and talking to the people. We will. Thanks. Yeah. I hope you have a good day. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.